Welcome to module 36 of database management systems. In this module and the next, we will talk about recovery in databases. In the last week, uh, we have talked at length in terms of uh, the transactions and the concurrency control and we will see how the acid properties of the transaction can be fulfilled uh, using the different recovery schemes. To specifically, we will try to understand the different sources of failure and uh, how the uh, recovery can be facilitated by different storage structures, particularly uh, those uh, different models of volatile and non-volatile uh, storages and uh, we will take a look into <coughs> recovery schemes that are based on logging mechanism and uh, for this module, we will focus only on single transactions. So, these are the uh, topics uh, that we will cover. So, we, uh, what we have looked at is uh, all database writes and reads are within a transaction and transactions uh, must satisfy the acid properties. And uh, in terms of the concurrency control, we have already seen that concurrency control guarantees uh, isolation of transactions and in, uh, in a certain way it contributes to achieving uh, maintaining consistency. Application programs are heavily responsible for guaranteeing consistency, but uh, to really guarantee the atomicity and durability of the data that the transactions reads and write, the recovery subsystem is required and it also contributes to the consistency property. So, let us look at uh, uh, if we are talking about recovery, it is in the face of failure. So, let us look at what are the uh, generic types of failures that can happen. One is that a transaction can fail. A transaction can fail due to logical error, due to some internal error or it might fail due to some uh, system error. So, that uh, the system must terminate the transaction. We have talked about uh, several situations where deadlock might happen and the transaction needs to be rolled back. Uh, that is a kind of uh, transaction failure error. The second possible error can happen if there is a crash in the system. A system can crash due to hardware failure, power failure, software failure. So, um, uh, we try to make fail stop assumptions that uh, non-volatile contents are assumed not to be corrupted and uh, database systems consequently have to involve a number of integrity checks to prevent the corruption of data. And uh, the third broad category of failures happen with disk failure, a disk might itself fail, its, uh, its hardware may fail, the head may crash uh, and uh, when that uh, happens then the destruction is assumed to be detectable. We must be able to detect uh, such failures. Uh, there are checksum and other mechanisms for detecting failures, but broadly these are the three types of uh, failures that a uh, database system can go through. So, in view of that, uh, if one or more of these failures happen, then we need uh, mechanisms to recover from that. So, let us consider a very simple uh, situation of a transaction which uh, we saw uh, earlier too that a transaction T i transfers dollar uh, 50 from account A to account B. Therefore, two updates have to happen A has to get debited and B has to get credited. So, the transaction T i requires updates to A and B that are happening that must be written that must be output to the database in a permanent manner. So, a failure may occur uh, after one of these modifications have happened and before both of them are made. So, that is one uh, possibility. One possibility is uh, we can we have modified the database without uh, ensuring that the transaction will necessarily commit, but the database has been changed transaction may not have committed. So, that will leave the database in an inconsistent state because the transaction will have to be rolled back or it may so happen that uh, the database has not been modified and uh, the, but uh, the transaction has committed. So, uh, if the failure occurs at that uh, point, then there will be some lost updates. So, the recovery algorithms uh, strategy has to primarily take care of two things. One is during the normal transaction, it has to collect enough information so that the recovery from failures can be done. So, one is what we need to do while a normal transaction is going on, because during that time we need to have enough data so that we can recover in the face of failure. And the second uh, set of actions are actions that are taken once a failure has happened to recover the database, so that we can uh, go back 
to a consistent state and ensure the atomicity, consistency and durability of the transaction. So, before we get into uh, these uh, discussions of uh, the different uh, recovery algorithms, let us quickly look into the storage model that we are assuming. We know there is volatile storage, we have discussed about that, we know there is non-volatile storage which uh, uh, are disk, stay, flash and all that, volatile storage uh, disappears uh, whenever system crashes and uh, non-volatile storage is supposed to survive uh, that system crash, but it may still fail, it may still cause loss of data. So, we also consider a third kind of storage which is uh, notionally known as stable storage. It is called a mythical form of storage uh, where we assume that it will survive all kinds of failures. Now, naturally this uh, in, in ideality this can never happen, but we can approximate this by maintaining multiple copies uh, of the same data on distinct non-volatile media and uh, the stable storage would be assumed to be one available component uh, in the uh, database system for making the recovery systems work. So, as you can see in this uh, 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 diagram below, so we are trying to uh, explain more of what is a stable storage. So, this is uh, on the secondary storage. So, you have a stable database. So, kind of approximates that it will never fail. Uh, whereas, uh, on, a, on a routine basis things happen in terms of the database buffers which are uh, basically volatile uh, databases, the volatile memory. So, now the fed, so what we do is uh, we maintain uh, multiple copies of each block of data and uh, keep them on separate disks. So, if, even if one disk fail, it is possible to um, uh, recover from uh, other disks. There are different kinds of uh, uh, multiplicity that can be done, even it can be uh, uh, located at a remote uh, location. So, that uh, even if there is a fire or flooding, the database can be recovered. But uh, in, in principle, we will assume that uh, there are multiple copies and not all copies can fail at the same time. So, it can uh, now this will ensure that if a data has already been written, then it is guaranteed that it will stay there. We have talked about RAID systems, but what happens if the failure uh, happens during the data transfer, where the result is still in an in a transient uh, the state, in, it will live with transient copies. So, block transfer uh, in general can uh, result in uh, either in successful completion or in partial failure. So, where the destination block actually has incorrect information or total failure where the destination block could not be updated at all. So, to protect uh, against the media against such uh, failures uh, during the data transfer, uh, the one possible solution could be um, and, and we assume that there are only two copies uh, of each block, it could you could have multiple copies to give you more uh, resiliency against failure. So, if you have two copies then the strategy could go like this that uh, write the information uh, onto the first uh, physical block, then uh, once that is successfully completed, then you write the same information on the second uh, physical block and uh, the output is completed only after the second uh, write uh, of the physical block is successfully completed. So, that is what we need to guarantee. Now, to protect against that, uh, uh, that uh, what happens if during this transfer, with during this write, if some uh, uh, output operation, if some failure happens. So, to recover from that, you need to find out uh, what are the blocks which are inconsistent, because you have kept two or more copies. So, um, uh, you have to compare two copies of uh, every disk block, you have kept them in separate disks and see which one, uh, whether uh, there has been some inconsistency. Now, this is uh, this is theoretically okay, but uh, this is very expensive because there are so many different blocks. So, what is typically done a better solution is uh, while you are actually doing the risk right, where you are actually doing the output on a uh, in the process of doing the output, then you record the these writes on a non volatile storage, say a non volatile RAM or special area of the disk and use this information during the recovery to find the blocks that are inconsistent and only compare those copies. So, that will be naturally much faster because uh, memory as you know is, is much uh, faster to access than the disk and uh, this is a strategy which is typically used in the RAID system we had discussed earlier. So, if either of uh, either copy of an inconsistent block is detected to have some kind of an error, the checksum tells you the error, then overwrite it by the other copy. 
but if both uh, have no error, but are different then override the second one by the first one. So, this will uh, make sure that uh, you always have even if there are transient failures, you can take care of that you know what is wrong and you can take care of and correct that. Now, to make this uh, kind of a mechanism work, we um, uh, resort to a very simple uh, model of uh, data access. We assume that uh, there are physical blocks uh, on the disk that uh, that are on the non volatile permanent storage and that is uh, where finally, you want your data to reside, but you also assume that uh, there are system buffered blocks the blocks uh, that reside temporarily in the main memory. So, they can be used in the in transit. So, when you move the block between the disk and the main memory that is uh, initiated by an input operation. So, you are doing an input. So, from the physical uh, block a, um, uh, that is disk a block physical block B is brought into the main memory or you have a output operation which transfers a buffer block B to the disk and replaces the appropriate uh, physical block there. So, these operations when you move uh, uh, physical blocks with the disk you call them as input and output. So, and we are making some assumption that uh, uh, the data that we want to write is small enough so that it fits into a block. Otherwise, there are several schemes of how you, you know, spread your data over multiple blocks. Now, the other part is each transaction on the other side is assumed to have a private work area. So, in the private work area, the transaction actually keeps local copies, and uh, these uh, local copies, say you have a data item X. So, you say that uh, for transaction T i the copy of that data item x uh, is x i and say B x is a block that contains uh, x. So, B x is a uh, physical block and uh, then you can transfer data between the transactions private area and this uh, buffer block in terms of read and write operations. So, we have two kinds of operations one is input output which is between the memory and the physical block that is a disk and the other is read write operation which is between the transactions private area and the system buffer blocks. So, the transaction must perform read before accessing x for the first time and once it has done that it has a local copy now and therefore, subsequent reads can happen from the local copy and the write uh, can be executed at any time before the transaction actually commits. So, let us uh, look at uh, also it is a fact is that uh, the when I want to actually output the block that contains x uh, I mean your data item x to be finally, written to the disk the output b x uh, need not immediately happen after you write. So, you are doing it in two stages from the transactions uh, private area to the system buffer to the system buffer to the disk. So, first is write the next is output, but this may not uh, actually um, uh, follow immediately once uh, the data exists in the system buffer it may be actually output or a, at a later time whenever it is deemed fit to do that. So, let us uh, take a uh, quick look schematically here to make uh, things simple uh, uh, understandable. So, there are uh, data items A and B on the disk that we are talking of. So, if I do an input operation then I am actually trans and this is the buffer this is a system buffer. So, this is kind of a common buffer where you can keep data and we will see how to manage this uh, system buffer and this is the private work area of a transaction say T 1. So, the process of read e, or I mean if T 1 wants to if T 1 wants to read A then the that read initiation will bring A onto the buffer area as x and then it will read x as x 1 in its private area it will this is where it will do the work this is a private area where uh, T 1 will do the work and possibly it has generated a data item y which needs to go back to the disk. So, again you will do a write to the buffer area and then at a later point there will be an output which will take this y back to the disk. So, this will ensure that uh, the uh, transaction can after reading the transaction can independently uh, do the write to the buffers and outputs can happen independently of that either before the transaction commits or even after the transaction commits there are different situations there are different protocols that are followed and we will see through, but this is the basic simple model that will regularly be uh, used. So, please keep in mind we will talk about uh, often we will talk about three 
areas the work area the private work area of a transaction this is in memory and the system buffer blocks where the data is uh, uh, temporarily residing on the way of being read or on the way of being um, uh, written and the system disk where the physical blocks exist and this is the pathway through this uh, system buffer that the read writes will uh, input output will happen and please remember that we will use the term read write when it is between the private work area of a transaction and the system buffer block and we will talk about input output when it is between terms of the physical block with the disk. So, the data access uh, you can I have already explained. So, in terms of the data access these are the steps that uh, the transaction will do to read or write as I have already explained. Now, in terms of now let us see that uh, how will uh, in the background of uh, such a storage access how will the recovery happen and how will the atomicity be guaranteed. So, to ensure atomicity in the face of failure we need to output information describing the modification to the stable storage without modifying the database itself. So, what we are saying that to be able to recover that uh, we should write uh, the changes to the stable storage you recall that uh, stable storage is something that is assumed to be not uh, failing without actually modifying the database. Now, we do a very uh, uh, simple mechanism which is uh, called a log based uh, recovery mechanism. So, we will first talk about this log based recovery mechanism what are the key concepts of uh, logging and uh, redo undo redo kind of uh, operations and present the actual recovery algorithm. There are other alternatives also like shadow paging we will not discuss about uh, that. And I would like to again remind you that in this uh, module we are talking about single uh, transactions at a time serial execution. In the next module we will talk about concurrency of the I mean the behavior of recovery algorithms on the face of concurrent transactions. So, now let us uh, talk about the log based recovery mechanism. So, uh, in the log based uh, recovery mechanism you can you can see this is the basic uh, this is your stable database which you want to make use of these are your buffers you talked of and we will have certain logs the information of what I have been doing in terms of the log buffers and the also a stable log which is a log that is written in the stable database. So, once we understand what is uh, logging you will understand uh, this, but I just wanted to show you that like the data there are buffer copies as well as stable database copies in terms of log also there will be buffer copies as well as stable uh, log copies. So, a log is kept uh, in the stable storage it is a sequence of records. So, log is basically a record of what I am. So, it is like I am if I am doing some task I always every task I do I keep a record of what I am actually doing and that is called the logging. So, when a transaction starts I write a log record which uh, puts the transaction ID say T i and then puts a keyword start to the log. So, that indicates that the transaction T i has started and uh, when it is about to execute a write. So, uh, before it has actually executed the write then I write a log record which uh, looks like this uh, which is. So, here if you look carefully this is uh, the idea of the transaction x is the data item that you want to write v 1 is the current value of the data item which kind of we can say is the old value and v 2 is a value that we want to actually write. So, here you can see that we are clearly keeping a track of what uh, we are writing and in that process what is the original value that would get changed. So, that is the main important factor of this logging that every with every write you remember as to what value was originally there and what value you have actually changed it to in that transaction. Now, in this process uh, finally, when the, the transaction finishes the last statement uh, of the log record is T i commit. So, that actually is a meaning of committing a transaction when this log record is written out. So, that is so a log will have start then different uh, write log records and then finally, a commit log record. 
So, there are basically two approaches of using log one is called uh, immediate database modification this is what uh, we would follow here and there is a deferred database modification in the immediate uh, modification scheme the uh, it allows updates of an uncommitted transaction to be made to the buffer or the disk itself before the transaction commit. So, before the transaction has committed that is before the TI commit log record has been written at that point itself you allow the updates uh, of the transaction to be made to the buffer or the disk and uh, the update log record must be written before the database is actually written. So, you must first write the log and then the actual uh, database item. So, and we assume that the log record is output directly to the stable storage. So, that it is not there is no possibility of its getting lost. Now, output of the updated blocks to this storage can take place that is a final actual output. This is where you have written the log that okay, I am doing this change, but the actual change will can take place anytime before the transaction commits or even after the transaction commits. If you follow this uh, uh, protocol then you say you are in the immediate modification scheme and in fact, the order in which the blocks are output that finally, written to the disk may be different from the order in which they were originally written, but the log records the will have to be written before these each one of these output are done. In the deferred modification scheme uh, the change updates are performed to buffer and disk only at the time of transaction commit not any time before that. So, that simplifies some aspects of recovery, but it has other issues. So, we will not talk about this scheme just know that there is an alternate scheme for doing things. So, now formally speaking what is transaction commit a transaction commit is said transaction is said to have committed if its commit log record is output to the stable storage that is TI commit has gone to the table st stable storage is the meaning of the transaction has been committed. Obviously, all previous log records of the transaction must have been outputted already because that uh, those commit uh, those outputs will have to happen in the same order in which the actions are taken. Now, the writes performed by the transaction may still be in the buffer. So, your transaction has committed everything is done, but your actual writes that you have performed may not have been outputted they, are, they may still be in the buffer when the transaction commits and those may be output at a later point of time. So, let us take an example here let us look at an example. So, here uh, you see the log records and here is a sequence of write and output uh, events happening. So, in the log record the transaction starts here. So, you have a log record of start what is the meaning of this the meaning of this is transaction T 0 is uh, trying to write A and uh, the current value is 1000 and it wants to change it to 950. So, this log record is written and you can see that the actual write actual write has not happened yet actual write is not done, but it is it already has uh, it must like in the immediate database modification scheme it must write the log record before actually uh, writing the output actually doing the output or uh, doing the write. So, this has happened here similarly the next one uh, is another uh, update uh, transaction for B and uh, then the actual writes have happened. So, which means the data has been written from the transactions uh, private work area to the system buffer and then the transaction has transaction T 0 has done a commit. So, at this point if you go up to this then the commit of the transaction is already completed the another transaction T 1 starts you please remember that we have said that we will uh, we are using serial uh, uh, schedules only. So, only now another transaction can come in that has started and uh, that has uh, written the log record for updating C from 700 to 600. So, there is a write for 600 then T 1 has come in. In the meanwhile at this stage in the meanwhile these blocks have been output. So, they have actually been written to the disk and uh, you can understand that uh, this block B B is a block that contains the data of data item the updated value of data item B and uh, um, uh, this B C has the updated value of data item C. So, you can see that uh, actually this output of uh, B is happening after the transaction T 0 has committed whereas, for uh, update of data item C 
the output is happening of um, before the uh, T 1 has committed. So, here it is happening after the commit, but here it is happening before the commit. So, both of these are uh, permitted, both of these are allowed in terms of the protocol that uh, we are following. And you can also see that uh, in, in terms of uh, the order in which they were written, A was written earlier, but A is output at a later point of time, because that is a different sequencing which the system might decide for writing the buffer onto the disk. So, this is uh, the immediate uh, database modification scheme through which we can write the logs. Now, the question is okay, we have written the logs. So, what is the use of those logs? Naturally, the use of those logs are in terms of two operations which we say are undo operation and redo operation. An undo operation is one which uh, basically undoes the operation uh, the effect of an update. So, while um, uh, you have done uh, you have if this is a log record then undoing. So, this meant that x was changed it had a value v 1 and it was changed to v 2. If you undo that then the old value comes back to this old value comes back back to x. So, that is if I undo this uh, particular action the which was put in the log record then x will get back its original value and redo is uh, doing the same thing over again. So, if I redo for this log record, then the value of v 2 will again be set onto x. So, these are the two simple undo and redo operations, which will help us achieve the uh, recovery systems uh, in full. So, what is meant by undo redo of transactions? Let us understand. So, when I undo a transaction T i that restores the values of all data items updated by T i to their old values. So, the values have been updated in, in, in this uh, forward order. So, when you go to undo you will actually have to do that in the reverse order, because it is quite possible that uh, x uh, got 1 here, then at a some at a some later point it was updated to 17, then at a some later point it was updated to 13. So, this this update possibly had happened from 0, this update had happened from 1, this update had happened from 3. So, all those transactions records are there and you are going backwards. So, you will first restore x back to 17, because this is then rest back restore it back to 1, then restore it back to 0 in this order it will go on. And uh, every time uh, you restore you write that write that out as a record which is known as the uh, read redo only record. So, you can see that here you are not uh, trying to remember the original value you are just uh, writing the value that you have uh, written out in terms of the undo operation that is the old value. And uh, the going in this uh, manner the undo operation will terminate when you have come across uh, the beginning of this, uh, this whole process. When it is complete then a log record T i abort is written out which says that the undo is actually over. So, this is the undo operation. For redo you said the redo is doing the uh, transactions, uh, doing the same uh, instructions of the transactions in the same manner it was done earlier. So, that unlike undo which goes backwards the redo goes forward and it starts from the first uh, log record of this transaction and goes on till the end and uh, for this there is no separate logging for this operation. Now, how will the undo redo operations be used? There are two major situations in which they are used. One is undo is used when transactions roll back have to roll back during normal operation that is nothing has I mean there is no uh, system failure or there is no data uh, disk failure or anything, but uh, if the transaction has a normal failure that it cannot complete its execution due to some logical error or because uh, it has to roll back because of uh, deadlock or something. Then you what you do you just undo the whole effect of the transaction go backwards and keep on undoing. But when the there is a failure uh, there is a failure and you have to recover from that then undo and redo operations both will be required as we will soon see. So, we also need to uh, um, uh, deal with the case where the recovery from failure while you are recovering from failure another failure happens. So, what do you do in that case, but that is more complicated we will talk about that later. So, 
first let us discuss what happens when you roll back a transaction during normal operation. So, let T i be that transaction. So, you have to naturally do the undo because you have to undo the effect that it has already created. So, you will scan the log records uh, from the end and for each uh, log record which is kind of an update like this you will uh, perform an update to restore the original value the old value and write out a redo only log record or which is called uh, compensation log record which uh, says that this has been undone to the value v 1 which is the original value of the transaction original value of the data item sorry. Now, in going in this process backwards at some point of time you will reach uh, come across uh, T i start uh, log record and when you face come across that you write the log record T i about indicating that the undo of the transaction is over. So, this is the basic uh, process of undoing a transaction during rollback. In the other case if you are recovering from a failure if there has been a failure then you do something uh, which uh, needs to be understood carefully. So, the transaction T i needs to be undone if the log contains the record start T i start, but it does not contain either T i commit or T i abort. So, but from T i start you will know that it has started, but because of failure it could not complete because if it could complete or if before that if it had to roll back because of the normal execution then it would have written T i commit or T i abort, but because of system failure you could not write any one of them. So, the transaction has to be rolled back. The other case is the case where the transaction needs to be redone is when the it contains the record uh, T i start, but in addition it also contains the record T i commit or T i abort. So, this is a transaction which had completed successfully it did the start it did the commit or it rolled back the whole thing happened successfully, but because of system failure changes have not been able to take place and therefore, you will have to again execute that transaction. So, that is why you do a redone. So, in the earlier case it is undone you want to undo the effect here the effects were given, but they somehow could not be uh, made uh, durable the database has become inconsistent. So, you need to redo that whole thing. So, um, uh, it may sound uh, a little bit awkward as that if uh, the it contains uh, the T i abort why should you actually redo the transaction. This is uh, just to keep uh, things uh, simple. So, that uh, you can uh, just trace back the original history. So, you do not try to really uh, optimize, but you just trace back uh, the original history and uh, do whatever had happened in the way and then uh, that simplifies your algorithm significantly and then if there are certain things which uh, um, uh, have been done by the undo operation you also want to go through those and maintain that status. So, here are uh, some examples here uh, the a transaction we are showing it is a failure recovery action at uh, every case. So, if in case A the transaction has started and we made changes to A and B and at that time the failure happens. So, naturally the start is there and uh, commit is not there or abort is not there. So, this has to be undone. So, this will be undone A will get back the uh, value 1000 and B will get back the value 2000 and two such uh, record T0 B 2000 and T0 A 2000 the two uh, compensation log records will be written and then a T0 abort will be written. Now, if you look at uh, the second uh, transaction, transaction uh, the st second uh, status that of uh, as in B, then you will see that T 0 has actually started and committed and T 1 has started after that which could not complete after updating C. So, in the case of B since T 0 has start and commit both you have to redo that because you have lost all these changes we have to redo again and for that you do not log anything. And then the T 1 could not complete because it has start and it does not have the uh, abort or commit. So, you would log record for undoing it undoing T 1 and you write T 1 C 100 and T 1 abort. In the third case uh, um, uh, both transaction T 0 and transaction T 1 has uh, commit start and commit and both have completed. So, you have to redo both of them. So, these are the basic uh, different uh, cases of strategies that you have in, in place. 
Now the question is if you have to do this for all transactions uh, when a failure happens and a failure may have happened say after uh, one year or uh, after uh, 8, 9, 10 months and so on. So, there will be a huge uh, uh, you know uh, uh, set of uh, redo undo operations that you will have to do it will run for a very long time. So, what we do is uh, we create something like a um, uh, checkpointing where we said okay, uh, we will uh, periodically choose a point of time where we will make sure that all updates have actually been consistently put in the disk and uh, the database is surely on a consistent state and that is called checkpointing. So, what uh, is done is uh, at a chosen point of checkpointing time of checkpointing all updates are stopped in the database. So, there is no changing changes happening all transactions are no new transactions are allowed no updates are happening. Uh, so, you make sure that all records that are currently residing in your buffer is uh, flushed onto the uh, stable storage all uh, modified buffer blocks which were not output were also outputted and then you write that this is a write a log record saying the checkpoint uh, L uh, onto the stable storage. So, where L is basically the transactions that were active at the time of checkpointing the transactions that have already completed you do not need to remember them because they are they, they are changes by the process of outputting all log records and all uh, modified buffer onto the disk you make sure that all completed transactions are fully secured now they are they are consistent they are durable but uh, those which are uh, which were still uh, continuing you keep their list and write that out in terms of the checkpoint uh, log record and put it into the stable storage so during recovery what we need to consider is uh, we have to now we do not have to go back to the last time the disk failed we just need to go back to the last time we did a checkpointing and when you go back to the checkpointing uh, you already know that um, uh, what are uh, the uh, transactions that were live at the time of checkpointing so you can scan backwards and uh, check out uh, what uh, where uh, they had uh, started so you need to uh, um, undo redo those uh, transactions and uh, then you see what are the transactions that have committed or aborted uh, have already there in the output in the stable storage. So, some of the earlier part of the log may need to may be needed for undo operations. So, you continue scanning backwards till you find T start and then you take care of that. Let me just explain through an example. So, let us uh, say that uh, this is the checkpoint where you froze everything and did not allow any further updates to happen and wrote back all the data. So, what has happened is it this transaction T 1 which is committed before the last checkpoint naturally there was no update pending for that. So, you have made sure that all the updates in terms of the log as well as uh, the, the system buffer has been written onto has been output onto the disk at the time of checkpointing. So, you do not need to remember this transaction at all. So, this can simply be ignored. Now, at the checkpoint you can see that uh, transaction T 1 was in execution. So, certain things had happened. So, at the checkpoint the part that has already happened the log records uh, for that as well as the uh, output for that has, has already been firmly put into the disk because you are checkpointing because you are writing everything. But this transaction is still in execution. So, you will put this transaction in the checkpoint log list. So, you will say this is uh, this is in the T 2 and this will need to be looked at. If you, so, so let, let, let us see what you, you will do with this. So, if we look at then naturally T 2 if uh, you have a failure at this point, uh, if you have a failure at this point uh, as you have here then naturally this is the last stable point you know where everything was written to the disk in a consistent manner. So, what you will need to do you will have to execute transaction T 2 once more to make sure that it is. So, you know up to this point that this been done. So, you need to redo this part. Similarly, T 3 if you look at it started after the checkpoint and it uh, committed before the system failure. So, you need to redo that as well and uh, if you look into the T 4 if you look into T 4 you can see that it started before the system failure of course, after the checkpoint and it was still running when the failure happens. So, you do not know what are the final results of that. So, what you will need to do you will need to undo this transaction. So, this has no impact 
you can just ignore these cases you have to redo the transaction and in this case in case of T 4 you have to undo the transaction. So, by checkpointing and you obviously, the, the point you the time you choose for checkpointing has to be judiciously done it may not be very frequent and then then it will there be a lot of over it at the same time if you do it in a in a very after a very long period of time then naturally you will not get the benefits but checkpointing is a very critical feature of doing the recovery in the databases so to summarize we have uh, uh, seen that uh, there are maybe different types of failures and different strategies are required uh, for handling them and uh, we have also seen that uh, we use different kinds of uh, storage structures and uh, judicious mix and management of these uh, structure can guarantee uh, recovery from failures and we have taken a brief look into the log based recovery mechanism which is efficient as well as effective and I will remind you that all this discussion was done for serial transactions only.